holy and merciful God. You know what it is that we need today. You know where our hearts are heavy. You know where we struggle. You know where we celebrate and rejoice. And so God, in and through and amongst the chaos and busyness of our lives, speak your word to us again. Through or in spite of all that's said or done, in Christ's name, amen. So last week we began our series focusing on some of the heroes of our faith, people whose courage and strength and resilience can become models for our own lives. And if there's one thing that I've learned from reading a lot of books and watching a lot of TV and a lot of movies, it's that a hero's journey is never easy. I'm still thinking about superheroes. I talked about this a little bit last week. And I think it's pretty clear that for superheroes at least, almost none of them get to have long-lasting, close, romantic relationships because the nature of who they are and what they do makes them and those who love them targets for the bad guys, right? I mean, even if Superman and Lois Lane get to be, get, be together for a minute, it usually doesn't last. Because if it's known, then she's in danger, and how's he supposed to save anyone else if it's constantly saving Lois? To be a hero is to face criticism and anger and danger and to do the right thing anyway. It takes being bold strong and courageous. And the hero that we'll explore today, Rahab of Jericho, is just that. But a little bit of background before we dive into her story. We're going to read from the book of Joshua. And at the very beginning of that book, we find the Israelites on the banks of the Jordan River. They've made it. The promised land is right across the river. But the one who led them out of slavery, Moses, has died. And now the Lord speaks to Joshua, who's been Moses' assistant, calling him to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall lead this people to possess the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. I don't know how Joshua was actually feeling, or the rest of the Israelites for that matter. I wonder if they were still feeling a bit grief-stricken, still mourning Moses. They've been together a long time. They'd gone through some things together. It's no small thing when you lose your leader. I wonder if they were feeling anxious or fearful standing on the threshold of the promised land, knowing that there were fortified cities they would have to overcome before they claimed it for themselves. I wonder what they might have actually been feeling because the encouragement to be strong and courageous is repeated Four times in just this first chapter, which is all of 18 verses. To me, that suggests that they were feeling the opposite of strong and courageous. Because the author keeps saying, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. It's like cheerleaders on the sidelines. I wonder if they were feeling this opposite of strong and courageous. And this was the mantra they just kept repeating. This was the phrase in the pregame huddle, right? Do they still do that where they all huddle up and they bounce up and down and say words? Okay, well, that's what they did at my high school. But can you imagine like all the guys huddled up, strong and courageous, strong and courageous, and they're about to go into the game? If anything, the Israelites are repeating this to themselves to fake it until they make it, right? We might not be actually feeling it yet, but we're going to keep saying we're going to be strong and courageous and we're going to move forward anyway. And then we come to our reading for today from Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. 
Let us listen together for a word from God. Then Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and spent the night there. The king of Jericho was told, Some Israelites have come here tonight to search the land. And then the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, Bring out the men who've come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the whole land. But the woman took the two men and hid them. Then she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when it was time to close the gate at dark, the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you can overtake them. She had, however, brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men pursued them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. As soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before they went to sleep, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that dread of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, since I've dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. A pair of Israelite spies head out to take the lay of the land, especially Jericho. It's a fortified city. I'm sure Joshua and his commanders saw it as the greatest threat, the greatest obstacle to overcome. And somehow these spies come to Rahab's house. Some interpretations suggest Rahab's home was an inn or a tavern and that she was likely an innkeeper, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, entertainment upstairs. Others take the text at face value in understanding her as a prostitute. She may have been, or she may have been a woman who found work and success outside the expected roles of wife and mother. And this is how ancient patriarchal writers would have defined and remembered her her. Whether she was an innkeeper, a prostitute, or both, as a financially independent woman, Rahab went against the expectations for a woman of her time. I wonder what she thought when those spies appeared in her doorway. She knew the Israelite army was approaching. Her house had a window on the outer edge of the wall. She could probably see them coming. And despite the fact that she has a father, that she has brothers, she is the decision maker for this family. And now she has a choice to make, remain loyal to her nation or throw in her lot with these invaders and hope for victory and mercy. Rahab had heard about these Israelites. 40 years ago, their God had parted the waters of an inland sea so that they could escape from Egypt. Who would have thought that a beaten down group of former slaves on foot, carrying their babies and all their possessions would be able to overcome the mighty Pharaoh and his chariot of tears. But that's exactly what happened. They heard about it all the way here in Jericho. And then rumors carried word about their conquests among the Amorites. Somehow, this small group continued to be victorious against seemingly insurmountable odds. And so Rahab put her trust in the Israelites and their God. 
when the king of Jericho came looking for the spies he had heard were in his city and his guard knocks at Rahab's door, I wonder if she answered with her best smirk and a wink. Sure, a couple of men came to me, but I don't know where they went after they came and got what it was that they need at my house. They're not here now, you know. People don't stay at my house. They get what they came for and then they leave. They've left. Maybe, maybe you can still catch them if you hurry because they're not here anymore. This woman, who is scandalous and sinful, known in her hometown, had the boldness, the strength, the courage to lie to the king's representatives to their faces. And then she turns around and makes a bargain with the spies. See, I hid you. I kept you safe. I'm obviously on your side. Promise me that you will keep my family safe. My father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, everyone who lives in my house. She negotiates like she's got the upper hand. But we know, we know. What kind of woman like this has any leverage? These are two strong men. I'm sure they could have done as they please, as much as a bear can do as it pleases in the woods. But she is bold. She asks for what she needs. She protects those who depend on her. She sees the strength of the God of Israel and puts her faith in the Lord. Y'all, maybe it was this way for you too. But when I was a child, I thought the world divided up nice and neatly. I thought it was easy. The good guys wore capes and the bad guys wore black. And you could tell at one glance to the TV screen or the movie screen who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. It was easy. When I was a child, along with my steady diet of superheroes, I watched the war in Iraq on the evening news, and I knew, I knew that America was always good and right, even if I didn't really understand what we were fighting about. I thought, maybe I'll understand things better when I grow up. And in the meantime, I was amazed. I remember I, I found my old diaries, and I was writing about, did you know how fast a fighter jet is? And did you know what missiles can do? I was amazed at our strength. And now that I'm grown, I realize that I don't understand war any better. Immediately following the terrorist attacks on Israel on October 7th, some of you asked my opinion on the matter as a person who is of Jewish descent. And the best I could do was to say, well, I'm not a person who's in the room where it happens. There are lots of classified reports. There are lots of conversations. There's a lot of history that I don't know. I have a limited understanding of the history of those peoples and the conquest in that area of the world and all the decisions and all the pain and all the injustice that's led us to where we find ourselves. But what I know in my bones is that terrorism is terrible and wrong. And killing civilians is terrible and wrong. And taking hostages is terrible and wrong. And I pray, I pray every day that the world could find a way to work out its conflicts without dealing out more pain and suffering and death. I don't know about you, but I mean it when I pray to God that God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Because I have a feeling God sorts it out better up there than we do down here. But here's what I also know. Jericho is located in the Jordan Valley with the Jordan River to the east and Jerusalem to the west. Around 2900 BCE, Jericho became a significant trading post for those on their way to the Jordan Valley. It's always been known for its agricultural products, dates and citrus fruit. In 1967, Jericho came under Israel's rule following the Six-Day War. In 1994, it was the first city to be given to the Palestinian Authority after the Oslo Accords. 
It was then returned again to the Palestinian Authority in 2005. And today, Jericho is in the West Bank. And here, in our reading for today, we have the account of the first time, perhaps, that Jericho was conquered at least conquered by the Israelites. After the spies return to Joshua, they give their report. So the Israelites advanced. They brought out the Ark of the Covenant carried by 12 priests, one person from each tribe across the Jordan River. And as soon as the priests' feet touched the water, the water parted again. Wouldn't you know, the Israelites and their God and their army walks across on dry land, the women and the children waiting on the other side of the Jordan. I wonder if Rahab was watching from her window. I wonder if she saw, oh my gosh, those reports were true. Their God can part waters, can make a way when there seems like there's no way, can show the strength of God's arm. Maybe it confirmed her decision. Her family would stand or fall with these people who have God on their side. Eventually, we get to the part of the story that some of us may have reenacted when we were kids. Um, The Israelites march around the city walls of Jericho. Did any of you do this? Thank you, Lee. Lee and I did this when we were kids at VBS, right? Like usually it was blocks, like those hollow brick blocks over there. And they'd build walls. And the kids, we would pretend we had ram's horns. And we'd march around the city walls. The Israelites, according to what we have here, marched around the walls For six days, blowing the horns, blowing the horns, walking around. And on the seventh day, they marched around again. They blew the horns, and the walls fell. Except for one piece of the wall, where Rahab lived. If we read in chapter 6, starting at verse 23. After the Israelites pour in and destroy everything, we read, So the young men who had been spies, went in and brought Rahab out, along with her father, her mother, her brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought all her kindred out and set them outside the camp of Israel. They burned down the city and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. Her family has lived in Israel ever since, for she hid hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Rahab, the outsider, the scandalous, the shameful, the traitor, she is the one in this scripture reading who is bold to confess The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. When she's faced with the brutality of war, confronted by a terrible decision that would mean life or death for herself and her family, Rahab doesn't freeze. She doesn't protest the unfairness. She doesn't run away in the night. Instead, she finds faith in the God of Israel and made the best choice she could under brutal, terrible circumstances. I wish it was easier. I wish it was easier for Rahab and for us. I wish the good guys wore capes and the bad guys wore black so you knew who you were dealing with at a glance. But we all know that we are complicated individuals that inside ourselves we contain multitudes and we're motivated by all kinds of things with all sorts of experiences and trauma and pain and hope. Even more so when we come together as cities and states and nations and we try to figure out how we trade stuff and how we get along and where we're bumping into each other and who's bigger and who's stronger and who should be in charge. Now we see in a mirror dimly. And Rahab is a hero of the faith 
because she finds faith and acts. It may not be perfect. It may not be fair. It might make us wonder if any war can be just, but we also know the world we still live in. And it's not that different. So what becomes of Rahab after this story? The story in Joshua, her story in Joshua ends here. Remembering her as one who was brought into the people of Israel, an outsider who became one of us through her faith and actions. But if we keep turning the pages of our Bible into the New Testament, to the Gospel of Matthew, we catch a glimpse of her again. If we begin reading in chapter 1, verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. It keeps going until we get to Jesus. Now, maybe you're like me, and you usually skim the genealogies at best, if not skip them entirely, because, wow, a list of names. Could something be more boring? But Matthew is doing something here that we might miss if we don't pay attention. Did you, there was our hero. Our hero made the list. In the long list of men, we see three women. Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. In a patriarchal society where lineage was traced through the father, this would have been strange at best. And Matthew, but Matthew doesn't just include some women in the genealogy of Jesus. He includes these women, scandalous women, Tamar, who tricked her father-in-law into treating her like a prostitute in order to bear a child. Rahab, whose story we just read, a prostitute and traitor. And Ruth, the foreigner who follows her Hebrew mother-in-law home when their menfolk die, then you know, makes it such that a really good man marries her. God works in some strange and mysterious ways. Rahab, strong and courageous, ends up marrying Salmon of the tribe of Judah, perhaps the most powerful of the 12 tribes of Israel. One of their children is Boaz, a righteous man who has mercy on the foreign woman, who comes to glean in his fields, who is faithful in caring for her grieving mother-in-law. And before you know it, Rahab, our hero of the faith, becomes the many times great-grandmother of Jesus. It's a wonder to me that Rahab's story, her presence as an ancestor of Jesus, was known and lifted up. It makes me wonder if I'd been there with Matthew as he wrote his gospel, if I'd been looking over his shoulder as he was writing, and if I was the editor and I would say, are you sure you want to include that? I mean, it's, it's enough, right, that she has the story back in Joshua, but like, do we really need to mention Rahab? Like, don't you think it might be enough to trace his lineage back to King David? Like, David's awesome. Okay, well, and we trace him back to Jacob and to Abraham. Do we really have to bring up all of those old scandals? Because it's easier to get hung up on what people might think of us, what they might say about us, than to live life boldly, to own our stories as messy, as murky as they might be, and follow God's call. Rahab puts her trust in God, acting boldly to save her family. She faces kings and nations with clear-eyed strength. She doesn't let the judgment of others stand in her way, and so God is able to work through her. Yes, even her, with her past, even with her strangeness, even though she's not from around here. And she becomes one of Jesus' ancestors, a many times removed 
mother of the Savior of the world. In saving herself and her family, she was given a place in God's story of saving all of us. And so I pray that we might be able to follow her example, to be strong and courageous as we follow God's call in our own lives, making the best choices possible, even when all the choices are hard, even when the circumstances stink. May we be strong and courageous like Rahab. Amen.